um, we can determine which part is promoted, which part is inhibited. We determine the direction of deformation, because that's going to tell us which direction the bone is growing. And then we grow the model, update the material properties, and simulate growth in a finite element model. So the results show that uh, our bone growth simulation could predict the changes in normal bone shape. So as a child grows, their bone changes shape. In particular, the neck, uh, neck shaft angle decreases and the anteversion, the, how much the femoral head is rotated also changes. And we could predict that with our models based on the normal walking. We saw that um, in cerebral palsy walking, we would predict bone deformities. And the more severe the gait in that fourth child, we predicted higher, um, more severe bone deformities. This is ongoing work, and we're now working on developing a more realistic musculoskeletal model. We used a scaled-down version of an adult, which isn't, doesn't take into account child morphology. So we're looking on using a more realistic model. And this is going towards developing subject-specific predictions. So if a doctor came to me and said, this is the way the child walks, what loads do we need to ensure normal growth? We could put it in and provide a tool for pre-surgical planning or design of subject-specific therapy in order to ensure normal growth, proper loads on the bone and ensure normal growth. So that's an example of bone adaptation in ontogeny or development of an individual. I have a broader project looking at development of bone throughout evolution, and that's called phylogeny. And this project compares bone structures across species. So if we look at a vole, which is one of the smallest land mammals, 20 grams, and a bush elephant, which is the largest land mammal, uh, 10,000 kilograms, there's a mass difference of six orders of magnitude. But the bone tissue is the same. The only thing that differs is the way that tissue is organized. If we look at the skeleton of these two animals, now these skeletons are scaled to the same size. Can we maybe turn off these front lights, maybe? Is that possible? <laughs> Uh, the skeletons are scaled to the same size. You see that the, oh, that's much better. Um, the elephant skeleton, the elephant, the thickness of the bones is much bigger than the thickness of the, the bowl. So what's happening is as the bones get bigger, they get relatively um, bigger diameter. So that's called allometric growth. All the proportions aren't growing in the same rate. And usually, um, allometric growth is measured in scaling studies. And the way that's done, is you have some measure of the bone dimensions. So in this example, we're measuring length or diameter on this axis versus some measure of animal size. And here it's body mass. And notice this is a log-log plot. So basically what it's plotting is the length is proportional to mass to some exponent a. And that exponent is a scaling exponent. Um, we plot it on a log-log plot because then it's very easy to find the exponent. It becomes the slope of the line. So it's been done historically because be <clears throat> 100, uh, 50 years ago, they didn't have computers that could calculate this exponent, and we still do it that way. So in traditional scaling studies, what they measure is the length of the bone and the diameter at the mid-shaft. We ask, so do the length and diameter accurately reflect the bone mechanics? Say you have three bones that look like this. They're all the same length. Um, you take a, a tape measure and measure the perimeter, and you assume it's a circle, so you can calculate the diameter. And you find they're all the same. But if you turn these bones on end and look at the cross-section, they're very different. And this is going to have implications for the mechanics. So things like the thickness of the bone, the cortical bone, this thickness here, the cross-sectional area, and the moment of area. Moment of area is a kind of a geometric measure of bone strength. These are all important in the mechanics of the bone. So the objective of this work was to determine how these cross-sectional properties scale with animal size and also with locomotor habits. It's a broad project that covers um, five different clades of animals. I'm only going to present work from two, the felids, or the cats, and the birds. So we looked at nine species of cats, ranging from the domestic house cat, which is about three kilograms, to a lion, which is 200 kilograms. In the birds, we looked at 47 different species of what we call terrestrial birds. So we're interested in mostly birds that get around by walking. And these birds can be divided into four different groups. Roughly uh, flightless birds, such as the kiwi, which doesn't even have wings, so they're definitely grounded. Uh, dabbling birds, such as the wood duck, which spends a lot of time paddling around in water or walking on land. Uh, weak flying birds, or perhaps burst flying is more appropriate, so they can fly, 
but just in short spurts. And perching birds, like the magpie, which spends a lot of time standing around, but standing around in trees, so they can fly as well. So we took these animals, and <clears throat> my part of the project, it's a collaborative project, is to look at the bone structures. So we took CT scans, or micro-CT scans, of the, the limb bones. So for the cats, it was the fore and hind limbs. For the birds, it was just the, the legs. We measured cross-sectional properties. Um, we developed an image on ImageJ platform. So ImageJ is an open source NIH uh, image visualization kit. And um, we developed algorithms to look at things like cross-sectional area, the centroid, the thickness of the bone, the diameter by rotating calipers, um, the moment of area, maximum and minimum, and polar moment of area. And this is freely available on uh, what we call BoneJ, available to anybody. So we can measure these cross-sectional properties along the entire length of the bone from our CT scans. Here's an example of what the data looks like. This is a tiger humerus and tibia. First thing you notice is that the approximation of circle is not super accurate, particularly at the ends of the bones. They're not very circular. Also, you notice the thickness of the bone changes depending on where you are. So not surprisingly, in the mid shaft, you have a much thicker bone than at the ends of the bone. <clears throat> so we can plot this scaling exponent, which I call alpha here, on a graph that looks like this. So now here's all the bones uh, of the fore and hind, hind limbs scaled to the same size. So you get an idea of the differences in shape. And here I'm plotting for each percentage length the scaling exponent. So this is plotting the cross-sectional areas proportional to the length of the bone to some exponent. So you'd expect if it was is isometric, that means that all dimensions are growing at the same rate, this exponent would be 2. Because cross-sectional area is length squared, so you'd expect the exponent to be 2. So what do we get? This is what we get. So this is plotting the scaling exponent for each bone across the entire length of the bone. Before you get too overwhelmed with this graph, the first thing to notice is that it's not constant. So what's usually reported in the literature is the scaling exponent for the diameter at mid-shaft. And what we notice is that might not be representative of what's going on in the entire bone, particularly at the ends of the bone. So at the ends of the bone, which are called the epiphyses, that's the ends of your bone where your joint is, there's much higher scaling. And that kind of makes sense. The bigger the animal gets, the bigger the joint is. And if you think about it, the bigger the joint, that means there's a bigger surface area spreading out the stress. So you have a bigger, uh, a bigger surface area spreading out the joint force, and that would decrease the stress in the joint. Also, a bigger joint space, if your muscles attach over your joints. And so that the bigger the joint is, the bigger the lever arm for that muscle. So it makes the muscle more efficient. So it makes sense that the bigger animals have relatively bigger joints, or epiphyses at the end of the bone. Wait. Also know is the scaling is strong at the muscle attachment sites. So if we look here, uh, here is the tibial crest, the patellar tendon insertion. So here's your tibia, where your tendon inserts onto your uh, tibia. We see very high scaling there, which is this red peak right there. On the ulna, we have the coronoid process and the coneal process, and those are muscle attachment sites as well. So what this indicates is that the muscle might be scaling as well. So the higher the muscle force, the bigger that force. So as animals are getting bigger, that might indicate that the muscle is also getting bigger, relatively bigger. Here's an example of what the bird data looks like. So this is all, plotting all 47 birds. Uh, the postdoc that I have on this project is from New Zealand. So he said we have to include the moa and the kiwi and all those crazy New Zealand birds. I grew up in New Mexico, so that's why we have a roadrunner, because that's the state bird of New Mexico. Uh, so what this is is plotting 100% uh, scaling all the bones to 100% length. This is just for the femur. And we're looking at a normalized cross-sectional area. So that's cross-sectional area divided by length squared. So you would expect as a bone gets bigger, its cross-sectional area is getting bigger. If we normalize it by the length, that says how much bigger is it getting relative to the, the size. The first thing you notice is that the bigger birds, such as the ostrich and the moa, and the rhea, which is about a bird that's about this big, looks kind of like a, a small ostrich, they have relatively bigger cross-sectional areas. Uh, what gets interesting is if we pull out birds of different locomotor habits, but the same size. So that's what I've done here. These are birds of all a similar mass, about two kilograms, but different locomotor habits. So the, whoops, the blue one is a goose. So a dabbler spending most of the time in the water paddling around or on land. 
the orange one is the kiwi, so completely flightless. The green one is a, a bush turkey, a brush turkey, so uh, can flap, but not very long and not very far. And the pink one is a guan, so spends a lot of time but standing around, but standing around in trees. And the first thing you notice is those birds that fly, so these down here, have a much lower cross-sectional area than those that don't fly. And that makes sense because uh, mass is very costly in flight. And so if you're going to fly, you want to minimize the mass. For the kiwi, it doesn't matter. So having very strong bones is, is a benefit. And so this indicates that uh, locomotor habits are influencing bone structure. <clears throat> so if you remember the objectives of this project, I said to determine how cross-sectional properties change with animal size and locomotor habits. So I've shown you how they change with size, looking at these wide ranges of animal sizes. I'm now looking at locomotor habits. And this is what work my collaborators at the vet college um, were measuring kinematics uh, using high-speed video and infrared markers and kinetics. So we're quantifying the motion very similar to how we do it for children with cerebral palsy. But now, instead of in a gate lab, we're working in zoos and wild animal parks. And from this, we can get the joint positions and the ground reaction forces, use inverse kinematics to get the joint moments. So these are the subjects that we've scanned so far. We've done cats in North Carolina, kangaroos in Australia, artiodactyls, which are hoofed animals in a place that trains animals for commercials in the UK. And birds, we're working with Monica Daly, who's at the vet college um, and measures birds. Here's an example of whoops, uh, what the data looks like. So this is a tiger. Uh, you can see the force platform in the ground. Uh, these are relatively wild. That's why we're behind a chain link fence. And the way we motivate it to walk is have an undergraduate student run ahead of it with a stick of meat. And I'm not kidding. <laughs> uh, so this is, this is the tiger. Uh, so this is a little trickier than uh, using humans because we want to make sure that we get a clean footfall, only one footfall on the platform. They know that it's a platform. They don't want to step on it. And so we need to motivate them to run. Uh, here's an example of a less uh, cooperative subject. Uh, this is the lead and the trainer. We got some great gate data from this trainer who was running for his life because this giraffe did not want to step on the force platforms. So here's an example of what the data looks like once we've processed it. Uh, here is in the blue shows the joint positions, and in the red is the forces from the force plate. And what we can measure, we're looking mostly at mid stance, though we have the data for the entire gait cycle. We're analyzing most of the stuff at mid stance. And we can look at joint moments. So that's the ground reaction force times the, the distance to the joint. <clears throat> we also have the kinetics, which are the forces for both the fore and the hind limb during the gait cycle. So this is still work in progress. Um, where we've analyzed all the cats, we're almost done with the kangaroos, and the artiodactyls are proving a, a backlog. But in this project, we've um, developed methods for analyzing 3D bone scaling as opposed to just single measure of diameter at mid shaft. Uh, 3D bone scaling gives you a much better idea of the whole mechanics of the bone. How do bones get bigger to support bigger loads and bigger animals? And methods for analyzing. Uh, animal motion. Now, putting these together, we hope to understand how locomotor habits and animal size come together to affect bone shape. In the next project, I'm going to talk about bone maintenance. Um, looking at bone adaptation, a typical bone adaptation model takes an in vivo loading model. So you're loading uh, bones of live animals. So they take live animals. Lots of different types of animals have been used. Uh, they impose a load. So this is either a physiological indirection or non-physiological. You can have just load with no other loads around it, or you load it and then let the animal walk around as normal. This imposed load on the bone creates uh, some mechanical stimulus. And it's lots of different. They're all related. A strain magnitude, rate, or gradient, fluid flow, fluid pressure, lots of different mechanical stimuli have been proposed in the literature. But this mechanical stimulus causes some change in bone mass and architecture. So the bone adaptation model that I'm using is a tibial loading model in a mouse. This is work with Andy Pizzolides at the Vet College. Uh, basically, what you do is you take the knee and the ankle of a mouse and compress it. Um, so these are live mice. They're anesthetized when you do it. Um, it's in vivo and non-invasive. You're not surgically implanting anything. It's in a relatively physiological direction. And it, it loads both the trabecular bone, which is at the inside part of your bone, at the ends of the bones, as well as a cortical bone. 
So the loading regime is about 12 newtons, about 0.1 hertz for 40 cycles a day. So that's about 10 minutes of loading at 12 newtons, which is fairly big for a tiny little mouse. Um, three days a week for two weeks. So that's six bouts of loading, 10 minutes of loading each, and we get significant bone growth. So you can actually measure the amount of bone growth in that leg. The typical way for measuring the mechanical stimulus is to put on a strain gauge. So you put on a strain gauge. A strain gauge is about one to two millimeters. Your bone diameter is about three millimeters. So if you're good, you can get one strain gauge on each side. Um, but that's it. You have two point measures of strain. So we said, well, can we come up with a better way to measure strain, something that covers the entire surface so we have a better idea of what the strain is in the bone? So we use digital image correlation to measure strain. Basically, it's uh, you speckle the bone. We do that by painting it white and then spray painting it to get a speckle pattern. Then you load it. So these are in um, dead mice, just the legs, just the legs of the mice. Uh, you load it just like you would in a live mouse. And you watch the speckles with two cameras. And so then you can trace how the speckles move and get a pa strain pattern over the entire surface of the bone. So instead of just having two strain measurements from strain gauges, you have the entire surface of the bone. So this is what the strain looks like. And we're looking at the, ooh, that's really dark. Um, we're looking at the medial side and the lateral side. So red here is positive, and blue is negative strain, so compression. So we're actually applying a compression, but you see some red spots here. And that's because the tibia is bent like this. So if you apply compression, you actually get bending. So you get compression on one side and uh, tension on the other side. So that's why we have tension here. Um, the other thing you notice is that it's not homogeneous. So if you put a strain gauge on, you're probably not capturing the entire mechanical environment. It's very inhomogeneous with these, what we call hot spots of strain. So if you look, that's at the before the adaptation. If you look after the adaptation, these hot spots go away. So it's fairly homogeneous strain distribution. So somehow the bone is adapting to reduce the strains. And we want to know how that works. In order to investigate that, we develop a computational model to look and see if can we predict how the bone adapts and the change in strains. So we start with our CT scans of the bone. We can create a finite element mesh. We then load the bone. We get our loading conditions by, uh, we actually loaded a bone and scanned it at the same time so we can see how the bones move relative to each other. So we get the rigid body motion and that gives us an indication of the load, loading on the bone. We know the magnitude of the load and now we know relative distribution based on these images. Um, we then create uh, our material properties. We use very simple material properties, homogeneous, isotropic, material properties for the cortical bone and the trabecular bone, which is this region up here, and we applied our loads. We then determined the mechanical stimulus. So in this example, I'm going to use uh, strain energy density as a mechanical stimulus because that's often what's been proposed in the literature. Um, we then used a mechanoadaptation rule, which says if that mechanical stimulus is high, you grow the bone. If it's low, you resorb the bone, you get rid of the bone. So that's Wolf's Law that I talked about at the beginning. If you load bone, you get more bone. If you don't load bone, it goes away. So that's represented in this um, mechanoadaptation rule. You then simulate bone growth. Uh, it's projecting really dark, but this is a surface mesh of the bone. Say we had very high stimulus at this point, what we would do is actually grow that uh, in the direction of the surface normal. So that point would move. The point in that mesh would move in order to re represent that adaptation. So we're growing the nodes on the surface. So it's periosteal adaptation. Periosteal means on the surface of the bone, and that's where we get the adaptation in this model. So we move the nodes. We then check to see, have the nodes moved at all? Um, if, it, if they haven't moved very much, that means that we're at some kind of homeostasis, that, that the bone has adapted. Um, if they if they have moved a lot, then we keep going through the process. We add the, we put on the load, um, calculate the stimulus, move the mesh until it's re reached homeostasis. So how do we do? The first thing we would need to do is check and make sure our loads match what we see uh, experimentally. So here's uh, experimental. The dotted lines here show this similar region of um, interest. 
And you notice that we're slightly off on the magnitude, but we're still in the same order of magnitude. So given our very simplified uh, material properties is definitely within the realm of reason. So we're getting uh, compression on uh, tension on this side, and at the other side of the model, we have compression. So the strains check out. We're not too concerned about the difference in magnitude, given all the simplifications we have in our material properties. So how do we do on the adaptation? So here, again, I'm using strain energy density as a stimulus. So if we look, most of the interesting stuff is going to happen around here, where there's high stimulus. You would expect where there's high stimulus, that's going to promote growth. So what I'm going to show is in cross-section. This is a cross-section looking down on those arrows. Uh, here's the, the cross-section of the bone. It's hollow in the middle. This region right here is high stimulus. So that's where you're going to expect the bone to grow. So if we actually grow it, you can see the stimulus decreases and the bone gets thicker right there. So <clears throat> we're growing the bone in response to the stimulus. Not surprisingly, the stimulus goes down. So how do we do with the ends? Once we've got our homeostatic bone shape, how, does the sh how do the strains compare to the experimental strains? So here we're comparing the, the, stim the um, adapted bone that's gone through our algorithm and we've actually grown it and adapted it to what we measure on the adapted leg. And you can see, uh, not very clearly because it comes fairly dark, but the strains are much lower and in the same ballpark as those experimental strains. So we're growing the bone in our adaptation, and the final adaptation we get matches what we see experimentally. But you can imagine there's lots of different ways we could grow the bone and still decrease the strain. So how can we check and make sure we're right? One way to do that is looking at histology. And these project really darkly. Uh, but these are calcine-labeled bones. Calcine labels you inject in the mice when they're still alive, and they're laid down in areas of active bone formation. So anywhere where you see green, you know that bone has been laid down. So in a typical histology, here's control. There's not supposed to be anything here. Uh, here's the loaded bone. Um, and you'll have to trust me, but there's green all the way around the bone, and those are areas of active bone formation. So we, we can check histologically where the bone is forming. But in traditional histology, you do this in single slices, maybe five slices throughout the bone. How can we relate that to our three-dimensional bone, where we, we're growing it everywhere? Well, one way can, we can do that is getting a three-dimensional histology, which we're working on now. It's a combined fluorescence and microtome together. So use a fluorescence microscope and a microtome to cut, so it's a slice and view. So you cut image, cut image, all the way through the bone. So you're getting a three-dimensional picture of where the bone is growing. And that will allow us to validate, is our model growing it in the right places? Using a finite element model, we can investigate other mechanical stimuli. So I showed strain energy density as an example. But now that we have a model that hopefully we can that is validated, we can start to explore other stimuli. What if we use fluid flow? Um, would we predict a different adaptation? Would, would bone grow in the same place, or would it grow in different places? What if we use strain magnitude? Uh, and having a computational model allows us to explore these different options. The idea is to eventually translate this to look at bone deformities in cross-section and cerebral palsy bone. So example I showed before were changes in longitudinal dimension. It's a different process. Endochondral ossification is a different process than the way the bones grow in cross-section. And so now we can have the ability to model both different uh, aspects. But in cerebral palsy, there's a lot of unknowns. We don't know the loading conditions. We don't know a lot of stuff. So we need to use an animal model to verify, to validate our, our procedure, and then hopefully apply it to a a uh, clinical case. The interesting thing about this model is that we're applying high loads to the bone in order to get bone to grow. Uh, but if you remember how we did it, we applied it across the joint. And in the process of doing this, we give our mice arthritis. So we're also using this as a model for arthritis, and we're characterizing the loading conditions much more carefully to understand what are we doing in this load that actually gives the mouse, mice arthritis. What are the mechanical loading conditions at the joint? So that's an example of how we can use high magnitude, very high magnitudes of loads, but very low frequency in order to stimulate bone adaptation. What's interesting is that bones also respond to the opposite. So if we use high frequency but low magnitude vibration, um, and that's the idea behind vibration therapy. This has um, been had a lot of press recently in the past in the past five years 
these vibration platforms. You see them demoed a lot in malls. Uh, if you ever have a chance to try one, I definitely encourage you to do it. It's very disorienting if you stand on it. It's very high frequency, low magnitude. So you can hear it more than you can see it, um, and it kind of disorients you. All the celebrities claim that it's the lazy person's way to get fit. So it tones muscle, loses fat, and builds bone. The idea behind it was you could put uh, older people who have osteoporosis and can't sustain high loads, you could put them on these platforms and their bones would get stronger. The clinical data for elderly is not that convincing, um, but for animals it is convincing, particularly the younger the animals are. So if you put young animals on vibrating platforms, they do respond and their bones grow. So that's what we've done. We've developed our own vibrating platform. This is social uh, exercise because they can vibrate with eight, eight, vibra eight mice can vibrate at a time. And so we're using 0.3G at 45 hertz. So that's very high frequency but very low magnitude. If you put your hand on the platform, you can kind of feel that it's vibrating, but you can't see it. You can hear it more than you can see it. We do this for 15 minutes a day, five days a week, starting at three weeks. So very, uh, that's right when the mice are weaned. We start very early and continue it for, um, for five weeks. And the question is, how does this type of adaptation differ from a very defined axial load on the bone? Are we getting more global adaptation? Can we predict where the adaptation would happen? So this is ongoing work. We've just sacrificed our first uh, set of animals and scanned them with a CT scanner. And I'm promised that we'll, I've been promised results by next Friday, so we'll see. Um, so the last two projects I'm going to talk about are what happens when the mechanics go wrong. And this is osteoarthritis and osteogenesis imperfecta, so bone pathologies. Osteoarthritis is usually considered a cartilage disease. It's when the cartilage at the ends of your bones breaks down. Um, anybody who's had a joint injury, such as a meniscal tear or a ligament tear, is at risk of getting arthritis sooner than everybody else. And that's because you change the joint mechanics. So the question that we're trying to ask is, how does the mechanical instability affect the progression of OA? So we're, again, using a mouse model. We give our mice uh, OA by cutting their meniscus. It's called destabilization of the medial meniscus. The meniscus are two pads that sit between your femur and your tibia. And they act to support the load, uh, to transfer the load onto your bone, and also as stabilizers. So we cut a ligament that connects the meniscus on one side, and it's free to move around. And what happens is these mice get arthritis, um, moderate arthritis, in about two months. So it's called a destabilization model, but nobody had ever measured the mechanics. So what are we actually doing? Are we actually destabilizing the knee? So we use these micromechanical testers that were developed in the, in the Netherlands to measure knee mechanics. And what we do is uh, measure anterior posterior motion, pull it back and forth, uh, varus valgus, which is side to side, and internal external rotation. So here's an example of uh, the laxity curve. So we bend the knee to about 60 degrees of flexion, which is typical for a mouse. That's, how, that's their normal um, flexion angle. We start at zero. <clears throat> zero degrees, uh, sorry, zero force. We then pull the tibia posterior or backwards until one newt <clears throat> negative one newton force. We then get put it back and push it forwards to positive one newton force. So it's force controlled, and we're measuring the amount of displacement as we move it back and forth. So you can see this is the the control leg. So this is a non-arthritic leg in the side that has the injury where we cut the meniscus we see a much higher uh, range of motion. So it can move much further forward, so particularly in the anterior direction. So if we give the injury and it can move forward more anteriorly, that means the femur, which is this bone up here, is sitting on the back part of the tibia. So we might expect it to see most of the damage on the posterior portion of the tibia. So let's take a look and see where the damage occurs. We use multimodal imaging to look at what's happening. We use micro-CT to look at the bone, and confocal scanning laser microscopy to look at the cartilage. So here's what the bone looks like. This is a micro-CT of the tibia. We're looking down on the tibial plateau. So this is looking down on the tibia. This is a healthy tibia, and this is an arthritic leg. So you can see uh, these dotted lines here correspond to these sagittal sections through the bone. So area one here indicates total bone loss, and area two is bone growth. 
So the bone is responding. Even though it's a cartilage disease, the bone responds. And that makes sense because the cartilage and bone are very tightly integrated and communicate with each other. So massive bone loss and bone formation. And this is after eight, week, eight weeks after surgery, so two months after we've given them this instability. Now, if we overlay the cartilage results on top, so this is the confocal scanning laser microscopy, we can get a three-dimensional image of what the cartilage looks like on the mouse knees. On the healthy leg, we see nice, thick cartilage. Um, so the thickness map, nice, thick cartilage across the entire tibial plateau. On the arthritic leg, not surprisingly, where there's no bone, we also get no cartilage. So there's gaping holes in the posterior part, which makes sense. That's where we saw where we would predict the femur would be because of the change in mechanics. Um, so most of the damage is in the posterior part. And it, even though the injuries on the medial side, which is this side here, we also see damage starting to happen on the lateral side. And that makes sense because you're changing the entire joint mechanics. You'd expect the mechanics, um, both sides, to eventually be affected. So now we're asking, how early can we see the changes in bone and cartilage? And so we can measure the changes in bone and cartilage eight weeks after surgery. But which happens first? Does the bone change first, and that drives the cartilage? Or does the cartilage change first, and that drives the bone? Or perhaps we're just more sensitive in measuring the cartilage or bone. So we wanted to see how early can we start to see bone changes. So we sacrificed uh, the animals at two weeks, and we had calcium labels. So remember, calcium is a fluorescence marker that gets laid down in active regions of bone formation. Um, so anywhere where there's green is where there's active bone formation. So here's in the control leg, and these are the DMM leg. These are uh, fresh results hot off the microscope, so we haven't quantified anything yet. Uh, not surprisingly, you see lots of bone activity in the trabecular bone. So this is underneath the growth plate. Here's the epiphysis. The joint is up here. So trabecular bone, that's where most of the bone turnover happens, so that's not too surprising. What we're interested in is all of the activity that's happening in the epiphysis. So this is right next to the joint. And as an optimistic supervisor, I like to think that there's a lot more green in this side than on this side. Blue isn't what we're interested in. We're interested in green. Um, so I think we might be seeing something, but we still have to quantify this. Definitely work in progress. We're also interested in knowing, does the thickness or density of the subchondral bone affect the progression of arthritis? So the mice that we've been using are C57 and Black 6, so your typical standard lab mouse. But they have notoriously thin bones and are also very mechanosensitive. So if we use mice with thicker bones, have a thicker subchondral bone plate, might that protect them from getting the severity of the arthritis that we see with our C57s. So we're using a Balb C, which have much thicker bones. And the idea is, could you predict which people are more prone to arthritis based on the density of their bone underlying their cartilage? And that's ongoing work. So that's an example of how altered mechanics affects the tissue. So we're changing the mechanics of the knee, and the tissue responds. And the last project I'm going to talk about is how altered tissue affects the mechanics. And that's in a disease called osteogenesis imperfecta. It's also known as brittle bone disease. And what happens is it's a genetic mutation in one of the proteins in your bone matrix, collagen. It's a primary protein in the bone matrix. And it's mutated and causes the bones to be extremely brittle. So children with this disease might have as many as 100 fractures by the time they're five. So it's extremely debilitating, and there's no cure for it. So we're asking, can we use stem cell therapy to improve the bone mechanics? The idea behind stem cell therapy is to introduce healthy stem cells. So stem cells are cells that can uh, differentiate into any type of cell. Introduce healthy stem cells into the bone that express normal collagen. So the mutation is in the collagen. We want the collagen is, in, is poor in these genetic mutations. We want healthy collagen, so we're going to inject stem cells that can then express healthy collagen. This has been done in a few case studies in clinical trials. So postnatally, using whole bone marrow transplantations. So normally, your stem cells sit in the bone marrow in your bones. So they take out the bone marrow, transplant it with healthy bone marrow. The stem cells in, your bone marrow, in the bone marrow then get into the bones and express healthy collagen. It's also been done in, in, in a single case, um, in a pre, prenatally diagnosed case of osteogenesis imperfecta. Because it's genetic, they can often predict the children who will have it, and also they can see the fractures on the ultrasound scans. Um, so they infuse the, uh, the fetus with stem cells. So the results from these clinical studies 
are promising, but at the same time, these children have been given a huge number of other treatments as well. So we don't know what's due to the treatments and what's due to the stem cell. So again, we're looking at this in a mouse model to try to see if we can optimize the stem cell treatment and understand how it's working and if it's working. So we use a mouse model of the disease called the OIM model, osteogenesis imperfecta murine. Uh, normally, collagen, which is the matrix protein that's affected, has three strands. It's like a braided rope. Two of those strands are called alpha-1, and one of the strands is alpha-2. In this mouse model, the alpha-2 strand is missing, so it's three alpha-1 strands all braided together. And the effect of that, it's a spontaneous mutation in mice, but the effect of that is that it mimics moderate to severe OI. So these mice are slightly smaller in stature and have very fragile bones and spontaneous fractures. <clears throat> so the stem cell therapy we're using is, um, I'm working in collaboration with a biologist who does this. She uses intrauterine human fetal stem cell transplantation. And what does that mean? Intrauterine means while the mice are still inside the mother. So Pascal Guillot, my collaborator at Imperial, she cuts open the mother, takes out the fetuses, and then injects them with human fetal stem cells. Why are we using human cells in a mouse? Well, it's a very convenient marker. Their human cell has slightly different DNA, so then we can track where those cells go and also what they express. The proteins they express have markers of human proteins, so we know what comes from which cells, what the donor cells are doing and what the native cells are doing. We're using fetal cells, so all of us have uh, stem cells, but the older you get, the less active they are. In a human fetus, they're extremely active because they're ready to grow. That's what they're going to do. So they're primed to grow. Also, fetal cells are less immunoreactive because they haven't developed the markers to label them as a foreign body on the, their cell surfaces. So they're, we don't have the immunoreaction. Re so this is a fetal to fetal approach. We're taking stem cells from a human fetus and putting them into a mouse fetus. And this it takes advantage of the growth environment. Both the cells are primed to grow as well as the fetus is primed to grow. We can also initiate repair before the bones are completely damaged. If you try to do it postnatally, we think that it might be too late. The bones have already formed. Um, so we want to start, start the repair process as early as possible and also avoid immune reaction. So the fetus hasn't developed its immune system and the fetal cells don't have immune markers on them. So we don't have a problem injecting human cells into the mouse. So that's what we do. Um, and Pascal found that the bones break less often, a lot less often, so about 75% less fractures. So she came to me and said, what's going on? She has done a lot of biological analysis. She knows that the cells engraft into bone, so the, the donor cells get mostly in the bone, and primarily in sites of active growth. So at the growth plate and also at fractures. Anywhere there's a bone fracture, you see lots of donor cells. She also sees lots of cells in the marrow cavity, which makes sense because that's where donor cells sit normally. Engraftment rate, however, is very low. So if you take a section of tissue, only about 1% to 5% of those cells is going to be from the human donors. And that she knows that the cells, the stem cells get to bone and they differentiate into osteoblasts, which are the bone cells. And they express normal collagen. So <clears throat> these, she knows that because she can see the alpha-2 strand. So the objective of my part of the collaboration is to determine why. So why are these bones breaking less often? What's going on? How are these stem cells affecting them? So we, were, we determined the mechanical, structural, and biochemical changes in wild type, osteogenesis imperfecta, and stem cell treated bones. And we compared how these bones behave through in a multi-scale analysis. So we're looking at the whole bone level, the tissue level, and the biochemical or molecular level. So at the whole bone level, we looked at changes in size and shape using micro-CT. So we're looking at the cortical bone, the mid-diaphysis, how thick is it, what is the cross-sectional area, as well as the trabecular bone. And we found the stem cell treatment had no effect on bone size or shape. So they're not breaking less often because they're bigger. So then we wanted to see, what about the mechanics? So we used a simple three-point bending test. You basically put the bone on two supports and press down in the middle. And you get this classic load deflection curve. So the, the more you press, the more force you need. Uh, with a wild type bone, you see there's um, lots of deflection before it actually breaks. In the OI bones, you have the classic brittle fracture, so it breaks before there's very much deflection at all, and that's characteristic of a brittle bone, of a brittle fracture. The things you can measure from these low deflection curves are the ultimate force, which is the maximum force the bone can take, 
the yield force, which is a transition from where it's linear to nonlinear, and the total work is the area under the curve. And this work can be divided into elastic work and plastic work. So if we take the ratio of the plastic work um, over the total work, that gives us an idea of how brittle it is. If it's very brittle, there's going to be no plastic work, such as this uh, OI bone right here. So what we find is, as you can see from these uh, representative curves, the stem cell treated bones aren't any stronger. So the yield force is the same. It's not, you can't put more load on it, but they're a lot less brittle. So they have a lot more plastic work. So our conclusion was that the stem cell treatment isn't making the bones stronger, but it's making them less brittle, and that's causing fewer fractures. So then we asked, well, what's making them less brittle? So then we went to the tissue level, and in the tissue, there's three different things. There's mineral, which is hydroxyapatite. That's a mineral in your bone. There's protein, and that's a collagen. And there's holes, which are pores. And so we measured all three. We measured the mineral using nano indentation. So very similar to a low, de you get a similar type of low deflection curve. You indent it with a little point. Here's what an indentation point looks like. We did this in different regions of the bone in cross section. Um, and used a viscoelastic plastic analysis. We did this in collaboration with Michelle Oyen, who's at Cambridge. Here's a typical uh, nano indentation curve. So again, uh, load deflection, forced displacement, very similar to three-point bending. But now the interesting part of the curve is the unloading part. So you, you're recording both the loading and the unloading part, and you're getting most of the data from the unloading part of the curve. And so then we can fit the viscoelastic plastic model to this curve in order to calculate elastic modulus of the, at the tissue level, tissue hardness, and viscosity. And what we found is that the stem cell treated bones had a stiffer matrix. So something about the mineral makes it a stiffer matrix in the stem cell treated bones. So we wanted to look at the collagen. What's different in the collagen? Well, what's interesting at the tissue level is the arrangement of the collagen. In a normal bone, the collagen is very arranged and structured, and that's what gives the bone the tensile strength. Uh, so one way we can look at the arrangement of the collagen is using polarized light microscopy. So we took decalcified sections of bone, shown, shown polarized light through it, and the polarized light highlights the isotropic and anisotropic regions. So you can see in the, this is the OI bone, and this is the stem cell treated bone. There's the collagen looks a lot more organized in the stem cell treated bone than in the OI bone. So you can see it with your eyes, but it's really hard to quantify using polarized light microscopy. So right now we're using small angle light scattering, which uses a diffraction of a laser beam to try to quantify how organized is the tissue. So basically you shine a laser beam through your decalcified section. It gives you some measure of the diffraction pattern. The more circular this is, the more isotropic it is. The more elliptical it is, the more anisotropic it is. So for organized collagen, we would expect it to be anisotropic or ellip ellip elliptical shape. So this is ongoing work. Uh, the optics are proving challenging because we need a spot size of about one micron to get sufficient resolution to be able to measure anything. Um, so we're still working on it. Uh, but it seems from our polarized light microscopy that the stem cell treatment makes the collagen more organized. So then we looked at the holes. The holes in the bone are caused by lacuna, which is where the, the bone cells sit, as well as vascular channels. And in order to actually see them, you have to go to resolution submicron resolutions. So we did this at the Swiss light source, the synchrotron Swiss light source. So it's very similar to a CT, a micro CT, a synchrotron CT. You just get smaller and smaller resolutions. So this is on the order of 750 nanometers. Uh, and you can't see anything in these pictures because they project so darkly. Um, so if we go to the reconstructions, uh, these are uh, reverse reconstructions. So what we're reconstructing here is the holes in the bone. The yellow bits are the osteocyte lacuna, where the osteocytes sit, and the red bits are the channels. We don't know if they're vascular channels. We assume that they're vascular channels. And what you see is in the wild-type mice, um, one or two big vascular channels. In the OI mice, you see a lot more lacuna, a lot more bone cells, as well as a lot more channels. This kind of makes sense because we know from previous studies that OI bone has a lot higher bone metabolism. It means it's higher turnover. In order to have higher turnover, you need more cells and more blood supply. So it all kind of fits the story. Also, but we know that all of these holes will have implications for the mechanics of the bone. So perhaps it's these holes that are contributing to the brittleness of the bone. We haven't yet done uh, wild type bones. That, that'll be what we do next in the Swiss light source. Um, so we think there could be a change in porosity, which is contributing to the decrease in brittleness. 
So finally, on the molecular level, uh, we used Raman spectroscopy, which is a vibrational measure, uh, the, a measure of the vibrational energy of the molecules. So it gives you an idea of the composition of in the bone. So here's what a, a typical Raman spectrum for bone looks like. It's like a fingerprint of what's inside the bone. Uh, <clears throat> there's each peak represents a different component of the bone. This big peak here is the apatite, which is the mineral. Um, this peak here is some carbonate that gets substituted into the mineral that you can start to detect. And these peaks out here are due to the collagen. So we can take this spectrum and we can do some univariate analysis, which means looking at the peaks themselves, measuring the peaks, what's the area under the peak, what's the width of the peak, and then compare those for the different groups of mice. We can also do a multivariate analysis, which takes the spectrum of the whole and using principal component analysis, then try to understand how these spectrums, the entire spectrum varies as a whole between the two groups. And so skipping to the, what we've found, um, we could detect a change in the mineral amount and composition. So even though we know that the collagen is changing, what we can measure is a change in the mineral. And that's not too surprising because the collagen and mineral are very tightly related. And so the collagen provides a template for the mineral to lay down on. It's not surprising if you change that template, you're going to change the mineral. What was surprising was that we found bigger differences in the female mice than the male mice. And we weren't expecting that because we didn't find that at the whole bone level. So we didn't expect at female mice didn't get fewer fractures than the, the male mice. But at the molecular level, it seemed like there was having a bigger impact on the mineral for the female mice. What's interesting is that uh, all the stem cells that were injected were female stem cells. They're from human fetus, but we're injecting them in male and female mice. And there's been some studies looking at stem cell therapies to show that there is a de gender difference. But because we weren't expecting it, our study wasn't powered to look at that. And so we're, that's for further study. So interesting slide. So we can measure a change. We think that we see a change in the composition of the mineral. Then we wanted to know, can we actually see a structural change? Does the, the structure of the mineral and the collagen look different? So we use transition, transmission electron microscopy to look at the collagen and mineral level. But now we're actually looking at the protein and the mineral. The challenges of doing this in bone are getting thin samples of hard tissue, as well as where do you look. So your bone is extremely heterogeneous. Uh, at the level of a single collagen, a single appetite molecule, you don't know if what you're looking at is representative. But despite those challenges, we've done some TEM. Um, the wild type, this is OI, and this is stem cell treated. Uh, they, again, project really darkly. But the, the black lines are the mineral, so uh, it's platelets of hydroxyapatite. We like to think that in the wild type, they're nice and aligned. In the OI, they're kind of all over the place. And if you imagine hard enough that they might be more aligned and then uh, stem cell treated, but this is ongoing work. So this is enough to show that we actually can do it. And now we're using this as pilot study for pilot data for further study. So we think there might be a change in the mineral and collagen structure. So in this treatment, we know the stem cells get to the bone. They express normal collagen. The bones become less brittle. The matrix is stiffer. And there probably is a change in the mineral in collagen content and composition. So where, where do we take this from now? So ongoing work is can we make the bones stronger? If you remember the low displacement curve I showed, the, oh, the stem cell treated bones were no stronger than the OI bones. They were just less brittle. So the idea is can we vibrate these mice and make their bones stronger? So what we're predicting is if we take t normal OI mice that have brittle bones and we vibrate them, their bones will get stronger but not less brittle. So we'll get more bone, but it'll still be bad, brittle bone. What we're hoping is if we vibrate stem cell treated mice, they'll get stronger and less brittle. So that's what we're doing in the vibration project. We're actually vibrating wild type OI and stem cell treated bones in order to get this curve so it's stronger and less brittle. We're also looking at how the bones fracture. This is in collaboration with Rob Ritchie at Berkeley. I have a postdoc who's on secondment there to look at the fracture path of these bones. How, do the, how does the fracture actually occur? How, what's the effect of the porosity on the fracture? Um, measuring fracture toughness and looking at R curves. <clears throat> so actually looking at the fracture characteristics of these three different types of bones. And probing further at the molecular level, uh, we're using electron tomography to look at the crystal size and shape electron energy loss spectroscopy, which is able to measure the composition throughout. So here we're looking down a collagen fibril and mineral interface. And so we want to know, how does that change in these different types of bone? 
and that's in collaboration with the materials department at Imperial. So I hope I've convinced you that uh, mechanics are important in bone, in growth, in maintenance, and disease. A change in mechanics can affect the tissue, and the tissue responds. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the people who actually do the work. So these are the people in my group who do all the work. And it's a very interdisciplinary work. So I have a huge number of collaborators, both uh, biologists and doctors, who are involved in the work, and of course, my funding sources. Thanks. Uh, we don't know. We don't know. That's why we're doing a computational model, because that gives us the flexibility to investigate many different things. It's been proposed in literature that it's strain energy density, but it's all computational models that propose that, nothing experimental. So we don't know. Um, it's probably actually fluid flow. Uh, that's what seems to be the most likely candidate, but all these strain-related things are related. But our computational model will help us be able to investigate those. So exactly. So different different process. So the octahedral shear stress was um, for how bones grow in length, and that process is called endochondral ossification. So you get cartilage turning into bone, and so that we we say that the the stresses in that cartilage are going to de, de, define or promote where when that happens, when does cartilage turn into bone? So that's how bones grow in length. And that's called, so that's the theory for how bones grow in length. How bones grow in girth is called appositional growth, and there's no car cartilage intermediary. So you just get bone growing on bone. And so that's where we're using strain energy density, fluid flow, that type of stuff. So it's two different biological processes. Both are regulated by mechanics, but slightly different. Exactly. So for appositional growth, where it's just bone growing on bone, we we think that it probably doesn't matter whether it's tensile or compressive. But in cartilage, it does matter. Yeah. Yeah. When you develop a model to help you how many children do you develop that model? Yeah, so, so I showed one component of that. So for the, the loading to, to care, do the musculoskeletal model, we use four children. Uh, to try to get an idea of how broad these, these different patterns are, we used 40 children. So we have data from uh, 40 cerebral palsy, spastic diplegic cerebral palsy children, just to get the spread of how different do they walk. And so we did some principal component analysis to see how different are they. And what we found is the normal children are all tightly clustered over here, and the CP children are everywhere else. And so that gave us an idea of, OK, the CP children have very different ways of walking. And then we can pick from those children which ones do we want, which are the most different, and which ones should we do a musculoskeletal model for. So it's, uh, where the technology is right now, it's not feasible to do a musculoskeletal model for every single child, just because it's so user intensive. And so that's how we decided which children we're picking. So we only did musculoskeletal models for four children. Yeah, of course. So um, <laughs> otherwise, a model wouldn't work. Um, so the typical deformities in cerebral palsy in the proximal femur, which is the part that we were modeling, is an increase in neck shaft angle. So your femur kind of goes like this. And this is the, the shaft, and this is the neck. And in cerebral palsy kids, it's more like that. So it's an increase in neck shaft angle. Also, antiversion angle, which measures how much the, your, the head of the femur is rotated relative to the condyle. So it's a rotation deformity. And we also could predict that. So we, couldn't, we weren't doing subject-specific models, and we weren't following up the children longitudinally. 
it's really hard to do that in cerebral palsy because there's usually some intervention. So you can't, you can't watch the deformity form because there's usually an intervention. But it was going in the right direction. So we were predicting increase in neck shaft angle and increase in antiversion angle. Yeah. So uh, I just submitted a grant to look at it in normal children, which is a lot easier because then you, your musculoskeletal model is probably more accurate. Remember, I used an optimization criteria, which is minimum muscle activity, which is probably fairly OK for normal people. For cerebral palsy people, there's no way. They have no control over the skeletal muscles. There's really tight muscles. There's constant mus muscle activation. So that's not an appropriate condition. So. We said, OK, let's go back to the normal healthy case. We see pinches and bones, so that, that'll be a good check to see if with normal walking, would we predict these normal changes? Yeah. Uh, so what happens to cerebral palsy is that uh, they start walking, well, if you ask me, it's, uh, they start walking, that influences how the bones grow. The bones grow wrong because if bones are wrong, the muscles are wrong. Because the muscles are wrong, they can't walk right, and it's just kind of a downward spiral. And in children, everything happens really fast because the bones are very responsive to mechanics. And so what happens is then they have multi-level surgeries to try to correct the bone deformity. So what we're saying is we can't correct, I can't correct the neuromuscular problem, but perhaps we could stop the bone deformities so that at least their bones and muscles are forming properly so they could walk right. Um, that's the idea. So you're exactly right. The long-term goal would be to say, OK, do these these, this physical therapy in order to put the proper loads on the bone to get it to grow right. That's a long-term goal. I'm working, um, I'm co-supervising an undergraduate student project with a computing department um, who's looking at, develop, and my student is looking at developing a, a non-gate lab based uh, monitor for gates. So the idea is can you put sensors in the shoes and maybe on the, on the legs somewhere um, transmit that data to a cell phone platform, and so you're getting data over the entire day. Because in a gate lab, if you talk to any cerebral palsy person in the gate lab, they're doing their absolute best they can in the gate lab. How representative is that of what they do during the day? If we can't gather data over the entire day, we have a better picture of what the loading is. And then can we influence that and use some training to try to, to prevent the bone deformities? Yeah. Thanks.